Good morning, and welcome to the Pelican Sound Veterans Day Ceremony for 2020. I'm Neil Collins, Chair of the Veterans Committee. All of us who served in the military remember being trained to be flexible and adaptable. That things in combat rarely go as planned once the first bullet is fired. This ability to improvise has served our Veterans Committee and the Pelican staff, which supports us very well as we plan for this year's ceremony. It's the third change in venue and approach we've had in the last four years. Who knows what will happen in 2021, but I can assure you a ceremony will take place. So let's begin today's event. Please stand as we begin our ceremony with the raising of the flag, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. One, two. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remove your covers and join me in prayer. Our most gracious and loving God, we stand before you as proud veterans, family, and friends of the armed forces of the United States of America, Canada, and our other allied countries. We have served you and our country faithfully and proudly. Today we salute those who have given their lives in defense of our freedom. We also salute those who are suffering from wounds, loss of limbs, or disease suffered while serving you with and our country. Be with those who are homeless or suffering from PTSD. And Father, please be with the spouses, the children, and the families of these veterans. Father, we know that you, your will is our will, and we must focus all our efforts on our eternal life to be spent with you. Most of all today, Father, we ask you to protect and defend those who are serving on active duty in our armed forces. Watch over them continually. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Jerry, for our invocation this morning. I hope you all enjoyed seeing our Pelican Sound veterans reciting the Pledge of Allegiance just a moment ago. We enjoyed setting that up with them. Uh, the fellows who accompanied the flag raising ceremony this morning, the trumpeters were Jim Castaldi and Tom Curcio. Uh, these men are longtime friends of Art Zen's who did our, uh, played at our ceremonies for Veterans Day for many years and who passed away uh, earlier this year. Jim is, the, is a conductor and principal trumpet with the Naples Concert Band. Tom played with Art in the Naples Big Band and a number of other groups over their friendship, which has gone on for more than 20 years. I also want to thank today and recognize all, all the veterans who sent in their pictures and information on their service. Uh, we're going to be playing that interspersed throughout today's ceremony, beginning right now.
Ted Robbins, who's a longtime resident of Pelican Sound along with his wife, Carol, has a special fondness for Veterans Day. It reminds him of his dad, Ralph Robbins, a World War II veteran when Ted and his sister Gail were young kids. We're happy to have Ted Robbins with us today to have a conversation about his dad and his service with Ned Newland, a member of our Veterans Day Committee. Hi, Ted. And welcome. Ned, thank, thank you very much for inviting me. Well, it's a pleasure knowing what we're going to talk about. It's a, it's a terrific subject. But before we get into your dad and his letter, let's talk about you. There are a lot of people at this club that know you, but there are a lot of new members that maybe never heard of you. Okay. Uh, tell us something about yourself. Where are you from? And how did you happen to join this well, club, etc.? Ted Robbins, and uh, I was born and brought up on Cape Cod, up in Massachusetts in Falmouth. And I met my wife in Falmouth. Uh, we both worked at a pizza place in downtown Falmouth, and we got married about eight months after we met. And uh, we've been married now for 58 years. We've got three children, all in their 50s. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, nine grandchildren, which is Terrific. a joy to us. Yes, well, I want to toss something else in about that. I happen to have served on the House and Social Committee with your wife, Carol, as you know. And out of that, we fashioned the idea of maybe having some um, bocce here at the club. And I think Carol volunteered you to get on the original task force. And that's when I met you, and we went around the community in the area to find out what are the other guys doing. And out of that, we have bocce. So uh, I know you've been active at least in that and probably a million right. other things over the and years. I also, uh, I also got involved in Turnberry. Uh, I was treasurer of the Turnberry Association for three years. So. Terrific. Well, let's talk about your dad, Ralph Robbins. Uh, he served in World War II. I note that he was 32 years old when he was serving. Uh, was he drafted, or did he volunteer, or what's that story? He enlisted. He enlisted. Okay. And before uh, he enlisted, he also, uh, and I'm not sure of his age, but I think it was around 28 or so, he'd go to different high schools around Cape Cod area, and also all of New England, uh, for the Red Cross and for the uh, United Fund and all those uh, uh, charity things, and he, he raised money for the, uh, for the war effort. And uh, he did quite a job. The problem was that they all offered him a job. <laughs> and then when the war was over, they forgot who he was. Oh. He never got a job out oh. of it. But, uh, well, what branch of the service was he in? He was in the, uh, uh, the infantry, and he was in the 38th uh, Division, or 2nd Division. 38, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> 38 unit, 38. Uh, no. 38 something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Battalion. He was in the 38th Infantry Division of the 2nd. Okay. okay. And did he serve overseas? Yes, he did. He, um, he was involved in uh, training in Ireland, and he went into uh, Omaha Beach on about noontime and, uh, in Normandy. Oh, my goodness. Was he injured? Yes, he was. He, he made it to about 10 or 15 miles inland, and they shot him in the leg, and the dum-dum bullet exploded and blew up a lot of his leg. but. He was able to walk. They didn't have to take the leg. I see he has the Purple Heart he as a result. Heart, right. He was pulling shrapnel out of his leg till the day he died. Oh, gosh. And how old were you while he was away? Three to four. Do you remember anything about it? No, I don't. I wish I did, but that's all. And I think the letter that you're going to read to right. us mentions a, a Gail. I assume that was your sister? My sister Gail. She was uh, three years younger than me, so she was just born. She was about ten months old. When he went over. Okay, so since you don't remember much of this, um, I was going to ask you if his absence affected you and your sister and your mother. You well, know? my mother kept the family together and uh, she did a great job. Uh, we had no problems that, I, that I'm aware of, you know, while he was gone, except for the fact that uh, she was all alone with, the, with us. Um, I, I think it had a big effect on the family because when he came back, uh, it affected my life more yeah. than I, I would ever know. He, they started drinking. Uh, Sunday was always uh, at noon time. They started drinking, and then it went into the week, 
and they were in and out of hospitals. Oh. And, and I, I think that a lot of it had to do with the, uh, the T, uh, PT, TPA, TPS. Post-traumatic syndrome. Syndrome. Right. And uh, I think that had a big thing to do with it. I think if they had known more about it, he might have uh, either lived a little longer or maybe perhaps wouldn't die. And maybe my mother wouldn't have either. And how did the letter get to you? When did you first see it or hear about it? Well, I didn't get it until I was a teenager, probably around the time my mother died. Uh, and was your dad alive at the time? Yes. He, he lived for two more years. And, then he died. and how did the letter influence your life if, if it did in any way? Well, my father, uh, and from what I know after he got back, was very, uh, he loved to help people. And he would go around, he'd uh, carry groceries in for elderly people that were walking along the street or something, you know, give them a ride home and carry the groceries in. He'd also, if someone had a flat tire, he'd stop on the road and change the tire for him. And those things affected me because I, I must have remembered all of that because I spent my life uh, coaching kids, uh, doing charitable work, uh, and, it, you know, I ended up with, not to put myself out there, but I, I was outstanding citizen in Peabody uh, for one year, and uh, I had a lot of accolades over charitable type work that like he would have done if he had been alive. So I think that affected me. I also went out for sports uh, and football. You know, I wanted to show him that I could play football. Right. And uh, he died while I was starting out in football. So I went on, I, you know, and made three all-star teams, <laughs> elected captain. And it was all because of his influence on, on my life after he got back. That's great. Now, he wrote this letter, which we're gonna hear in just a minute, uh, before he was injured. When he got home, did he have any, and you obviously talked to him about this letter because uh, you saw it when he was still alive. Right. Did he have any change of heart in terms of patriotism Absolutely or anything? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. In fact, right. it was more. Great. I told you he went around uh, trying to raise money for yeah. the Red Cross and et cetera. And, uh, you know, those sort of things stuck with me too, so I always tried to raise a lot of money. I ran a lot of committees and everything. That's a great story. Yeah. Well, enough of this. Let's see and hear, let's hear the letter. Somewhere in England, April 25th, 1944. Dear Teddy and Keel, I'm writing this letter to you from England, and I want you both to know that I am very proud of you. I haven't seen much due to the curse of war, but I am always thinking of you both and your wonderful mother. First, I'm going to try and tell you something about why we are fighting, what we are fighting for, and how I happen to be over here in England, 3,000 miles away, instead of home with my family. Well, it seems a man named Hitler over in Germany thought he was going to rule the world after he got through conquering us. He thought he was going to take the best country in the world, the United States of America. But well, we didn't like his ideas and kind of upset his plans. Your mother and I figured it all out and decided the best thing for me to do was to enlist and do whatever I could to defend our country. Well, that's what I did, and here I am in England. Now I want you both to remember a few things that I know are true from my experiences so far. First, the USA is the best country in the world. I want you both to study history, American history, and learn all about the great country in which you live. You see, Teddy and Gil, most people don't realize what things are like in other countries. And if they did, they would appreciate the states all the more. I want you both to read about George Washington, Abe Lincoln, General Marshall, and all other figures in American history. Also, read about how this country was started. Read all about the Bill of Rights and remember that the cause we are fighting for is a just one and that all men are created equal that all persons have the right to worship as they please, and freedom of the press. Read all about it. When you've finished, I think you will agree with every word I have said, and I hope that this time wars will stop being fought and the world will be at peace forever. If, however, you should ever be called on to defend your country, don't hesitate. Do it at once, regardless of what anyone tells you. I guess I've been talking kind of deep for both of you, but if anything should ever happen to me, I know your mother will read this letter to you when you get older and can understand what I'm trying to say. I hope to be home with you all soon and be your old man again. 
I love you both very much, and your mother is the sweetest mother, sweetest mother on earth. Don't ever forget that, and always remember how proud I am of my family. All my love, and God bless you all. Dad. That's awesome. We've continued our tradition of the missing man table, also known as the fallen comrade. This is a place of honor for those who have fallen in battle, are missing, or are imprisoned service members. For the last week, we've had the missing man table set up in both the River Club and the main clubhouse. I hope you've had a chance to look at it and say a prayer for the people it memorializes. With this virtual ceremony in 2020, we're not able to do our usual muster call for each service, but we do want to recognize our branches. In fact, if you want to stand up at home when you're called, please do so. We'll start by recognizing veterans from the Army, from the Navy, from the Marine Corps, and a belated happy birthday for yesterday's occasion. The U.S. Air Force, the Coast Guard, the Merchant Marines, and members of other services from Canada and our allies. Please give yourselves a hand now and know that your service is valued by other veterans and by all the members of the Pelican Sound community.
We lost a number of Pelican Sound veterans this year. We honor their memories today. They include Franklin John Rademacher Jr., Army National Guard. John Patrick McKnight, U.S. Marine Corps. Vincent D'Amico, U.S. Navy. Robert Cameron, U.S. Army Reserves. Roger Baker, National Guard. Roger was a husband of Mary Ann Baker, a member of this committee. Art Zenz, U.S. Army. Let us observe a moment of silence in their honor. Thanks to all these veterans for their service to our country. You will be missed. Please let us know if there are any other veterans with Pelican Sound connections who passed away this year so we can honor them in next year's ceremony. Our good friend Art Zins passed away in May. Art was a veteran. As far as we know, he was the last World War II veteran at Pelican Sound. Art had played taps at our annual ceremony for many years after being recruited by his good friend, Jack Del Hagen. Jack was a former Navy Lieutenant Commander who founded this event at Pelican Sound 13 years ago in 2007. Some actually knew Art from playing golf, an activity he enjoyed immensely. But few, except close friends, knew this modest man was a skilled musician he showcased his love of music as a teacher, a jazz master, and a performing musician for more than 80 years. So today on Veterans Day, it's fitting that we remember and honor Art and tell you the rest of the story. Art was born in Milwaukee, January of 1927. His musical interests came early. His first gig as a trumpet player was with his brother's band at the age of 12. He played in grammar school bands at Marquette High School, where he was a member of the school marching band and orchestra. His talent was exhibited when he played in bands and jazz groups outside the school as well. Art went from a graduating high school senior to a buck private in June 1945. He did basic and infantry training at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where he qualified as a marksman in rifle, auto rifle, bazooka, mortars, and machine guns. Obviously, his talents went well beyond his musical expertise. After basic training, he was assigned as a musician to the Army's 256th Ground Force Band in Little Rock, Arkansas. In addition, while stationed there, he did gigs both on and off the base. Honorably, honorably discharged in December 1946, Hart headed for Milwaukee State Teachers College on the GI Bill. There, he graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Music where he was active in bands and orchestra both on and off campus. Never one to sit still, Art began his professional teaching career in September 1951. He signed his first teaching contract with the annual salary of $3,000. Thus began a 35-year career, primarily in Milwaukee's Fox Point Bayside School District as a music teacher, as well as the band and orchestra director. Currently, to preserve his iconic le legacy in the school district, a $500 annual trumpet scholarship is being organized to immortalize his name in the local Milwaukee area. He was also busy musically outside the classroom. He played in the Green Bay Packers Stadium Band and founded and led the Milwaukee Bucks Dixieland Band for 12 years. Amazingly, he wrote the arrangements for every single piece the Bucks Dixieland Band played. Art also wrote arrangements and played in Milwaukee's nationally famous circus parade. For all his expertise, Art was above all modest. Very few people knew he played in pickup bands with the likes of Bob Hope, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, Mel Torme, Red Skelton, The Carpenters, Stevie Wonder, and others. Art retired from teaching in 1987, but kept a busy pace, which included numerous travel adventures with his wife, Dot. He was very active in the local musical scene, playing with the Naples Concert Band, Naples Big Band, and the Gulf Coast Big Band, as well as sitting in with many other bands from time to time. He kept playing into his early 90s, including last year's Pelican Sound Veterans Day Ceremony.
As stated earlier, Jack Delhagen was a friend of Art Zen's for many years. He captured the man in a note he sent our Veterans Committee for this event. Let me share a few of Jack's comments. Jack begins, I played golf with Art a couple times a week for 20 years. He never complained and was always there with an attaboy. He witnessed my, meaning Jack's, hole in one and commented when the ball was in the air, I think you're gonna like this one. On the golf course, we old guys helped each other out a lot. We actually thought we were having fun. Jack summed up Art's feelings when on one liquid social occasion he asked if all the many bands he played in really needed him. His reply was surprising. Art said he needed the bands, they were his life. Art had a long, well-lived, full life. It was truly an honor to have had the master play taps for us at our Pelican Sound Veterans Day ceremonies. Art once told his friend Jack that he played taps thousands of times. Well, this time it's for you, old friend. This time it's for you.